In the name of the glorious Trinity, Father and Son and Holy Spirit, forever. Amen. Glory be to the everlasting mercies which sent you to us, O Christ, the light of the world and the life of all. Give us wisdom by your law and enlighten our impulses by your knowledge. Sanctify our souls by your truth and grant that we may be obedient to your words and may fulfill your commandments at every hour. O you who enlightens the rational with the knowledge of your greatness, do enlighten, O my Lord, our thoughts, that we may meditate upon your holy and divine scriptures at all times, O Lord of all, Father and Son and Holy Spirit forever. Amen. I pray that everyone had a blessed Christmas and New Year. I would like to just take a minute on behalf of Father Gennard, Stephen, and myself of how grateful we are for all of our listeners as we have delivered 38 episodes. Praise God. I pray that this Christian podcast has encouraged someone to grow in their faith. I would also like to thank you all for your feedback, comments, and suggestions. In today's episode, we have a very special guest who has been a very active church member from being a youth member to president of youth and now part of the NEC committee. Kristen Marelia will be interviewing Father Gennard about his journey to priesthood. Here is Kristen. Hello, beloved listeners. Today, I have the privilege of interviewing Father Gennard Lazar. Father Gennard is someone I've had the opportunity of working alongside toward the fruition of our local youth ministry here in the Central Valley of California for the past 10 years. We all go through a season or seasons of difficulties, but we know that the Lord is always there. Although we may experience hopelessness, it is through this season in which we experience a purification of our hearts. Whatever unexpected situation the Lord puts before us is in our best interest. As written in Philippians 4, 6 to 7, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your heart and minds in Christ Jesus. We thought it would be fitting to capture Father Gennard's testimony to serve as a testament of hope and encouragement for whatever God places before you in the coming days. Here we go. Shlama Rabbi. Shlama Zista, how are you? Good, how are you? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for having me as your guest on the podcast. It's nice to be on this side of the microphone. <laughs> oh, lovely, lovely to be with you and thank you for being with us too. Yeah, thank you. First thing first, I think something myself and many of the listeners are curious about is what does your name mean? It's not a common name, Jannard, in the Syrian community. Mm. So what was the inspiration behind it? You know what, there is a history behind it and I'm glad you asked me that question. My name is supposed to be Shinar. Shinar you'll find, which was a city in Assyria in the Old Testament. So, in the Persian language, it was Jinar. <laughs> so when I got to Australia, people were having so much difficulties. Like, every time, I kid you not, Kristen, every time I would mention my name, it was always, sorry, what was that? People have called me Jum'a, which means Friday in Arabic. Jiftar. <laughs> so one day... um. Uh, his then Grace uh, Marmilis, now the Metropolitan, when he arrived in Australia, he was visiting the family and we had invited him. And he asked me, he goes, uh, what's your name? And I thought to myself, oh my God, here we go. I said, Jeanard, he goes, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> At that time, I told people my name is Tony. I changed. Today, some of my old friends still call me Tony. So I said, oh, you see, it's Jinar. He goes, no, 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 why are you so reluctant? I said, because I have an issue with my f f name. He goes, no, no, your name's supposed to be Jenard. So Marmilas has renamed me. So fast forward many, many <laughs> years, back in 1994, I specifically remember this day, I was visiting uh, the United States with my family, and Melissa was only born then. I was visiting my friends, and I could hear someone call out, Shinar. 
I turned around, I, but no one was looking at me. So I, you know, didn't pay much attention. And then I, I heard it again, it goes, Shinar. I thought, who are you calling? And they said, this little child, his name is Shinar. I thought, oh my God, this is about 30 years down the track. My name was supposed to be Shinar. But um, Shinar is a city, um, as I said, or, or a region in, um, in Ashur. You'll find that in the Old Testament. I'm not sure which book it is. So, yeah. No, that's and then Jenard is Marmilus' invention. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you, Ravi. So in one sentence, who is Father Jenard? <laughs> is the person sitting next to you? <laughs> um, one sentence. You can, yeah. <laughs> Father Jenard is an unworthy servant of Christ. Very nice. Mm. So let's go into your early upbringing. So where were you born and raised? I was born in Iran, in Urmia, in the village of Syria. Syria Marsarius. So all those Syrians or the Syrians. <laughs> I was born in Syria Marsarius in Iran um, in uh, 1966. And when did you move to Australia? I moved to Australia in 1975. I was nine years old then and um, directly to Sydney. And briefly kind of explain, I know you were very young, but explain that transition from Iran to Australia and why specifically Australia? I didn't like ham on the plane. <laughs> And my dad was forcing me to eat it, and I, you know, I'm sorry to say, but I, I had to um, throw it up on the plane. <laughs> oh, no. And on, and let me tell you, there's another story there as well. On that same plane were uh, the late Mardenha and the late Marnarse oh. as well, traveling to Australia. Yeah. So um, yeah, when I when I arrived in Sydney and I saw the greenery and you know it was it was amazing. It was it was like I was in a wonderland. Oh. You know? yeah. <laughs> And then, so what's one of your earliest memories as a child? Earliest memory is, you know, in Iran, it would snow and um, we would make a, we call it the seesaw. Is that what it's called? The seesaw? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, it was one of those make it do your own seesaw. And I remember when I was on there, um, I had jammed my thumb and my actual nail from the thumb peeled. Wow. That is my earliest um Memory, wow. not a not a great memory, is it? <laughs> I remember I had uh, I think dislocated my hip, and so <laughs> these are the memories I have. So touch up on your upbringing, your childhood in Australia, maybe from like the age of like ten to seventeen. You know what were you doing? Were you involved in the church at all? Going to Sunday school, the Friday language school. Um, well, in Iran, we weren't so active in the church simply because the church was uh, uh, quite a distance from home. But we would go every now and then at um, um, Sharq Ashuri, at Margi Wargis Church, and Matmariam Church as well, the Catholic Church. Um, when we did uh, when we did arrive in Sydney, I was at the age of eleven, and I basically was involved in the church. Um, uh, my dad would. Um, he was the pioneer behind me going to church every Sunday. So at the age of 11, I would be at church. And as I was, you know, we were speaking about this, I wouldn't be sleeping in my mother's lap or my arms. I would be, I had to sit with the readers in the front. And they're all old people too. I was the youngest. And I would be frowned upon sometimes like, what's this kid doing here? Simply because if I didn't, I would um, I would be disciplined when I got home. So there was a lot of discipline, physical discipline at times from my father. But um, yeah, I've been I've been involved in the church at the, since the age of 11. So now let's fast forward to your after high school days. So now you're about 17, 18 years uh, old. High school. Let's talk about high school. Oh, Why are you fast forwarding? Uh, That's okay. No. If you want to, we can yeah. definitely talk about that too. Yeah. You want to talk about high school? Um, high school, yeah. I I changed two high schools. Um, um, great memories, um, you know, exploring exploring life, but again, being very very careful because I was raised in a very very strict environment. My dad, uh, God rest his soul, very strict. Um, and if my sisters are listening now, they know what I mean by very very strict. Some people um, would come and complain about how how demanding their parents were. I'd say, no, 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 don't even, you know, you gotta you gotta jump for joy because very strict environment. So at high school, I was exploring things, but you know, very discreetly, like you know, smoking cigarettes. Never tried alcohol or any drugs or what have you. Um, but um, yeah, I was I was a little bit rebellious at school. Um, 
Um, <laughs> I mean, I have to tell you this. My parents were called um, simply because I had, uh, in the science lab, I did something that put the whole school in danger. St. John's Park <laughs> High School, those are... Um, Peter Ponzo, if you're listening. Um, in any case, um, I, was, I, was, um, I was not the angel. I was the clown of the, the class. I would love to make people laugh and, you know, but... Um, yeah, I was I was the ordinary person, and um, growing up in high school, and and keeping in mind that I was very much involved in the church during high school as well. And do you think your involvement in the church at that time really helped you in a sense? Because you know we have a lot of listeners that are in that high school age, and they go through many difficulties living in society, a lot of temptations, like you mentioned a little bit about you know being exposed to a lot of drinking and smoking, and that influence from friends that are living in society, maybe not of the Christian faith or of different cultures, maybe not having that strict lifestyle as far as parent wise. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what could you kind of be an encouragement to tell those high school listeners that are listening, how you overcame that more of a difficult time Mm -hmm. and the influence that you had around you at the time? It was my conscience, Kristen. Um, Yes, I would do things and, and, you know, again, my parents wouldn't know and the teachers couldn't see. But uh, I remember, and I call, recall back very, very clearly, my conscience would, would uh, steer me in the right direction. Like when I would do something wrong, um, my conscience would be eating me alive, as they say. You know, I knew it was wrong. I'd, I'd, I'd go back and I would pray, Lord, forgive me, Lord. And I would continue to, to do the same thing, you know, uh, as we read in the Proverbs, like, to, like a dog who returns to its vomit. Oh, I used to go back to that vomit <laughs> many times, right? But that conscience was always, and, and looking back now, I felt, I, I thank God, and I know that, yes, the, the disciplinary environment I was in, but at the same time, from that point, God was steering and, and directing that, no, no, my son, this is not right, because I have bigger and greater plans for you. So, um, you know, my, uh, my advice always has been to anyone who comes and opens up with struggles, I say, you know, examine your conscience, because... Christians have the Holy Spirit. He who is in you is greater than he who is in the world, which is the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is that that voice of God. It is God within us that uh, you know reminds us what is right and what is wrong. So my conscience um, did me a lot of favors. Beautiful. So now we can move a little bit forward. Now in that 17, 18, you're in Australia. You've been enrolled in public school, and you kind of touched upon the different struggles and how you overcame those at that point. And you have a lot of friends of different cultures, maybe religions, living a variety of lifestyles. You know, what was your life goal at that time? Did you want to pursue higher education? Did you want to go get a job? What what did you want to do? I hated school. (laughs) I didn't like reading. Uh, To date, I don't like reading books. I only read the Bible. And let me tell you, I haven't read the Bible cover to cover, as some people have. I haven't read the Bible, uh, you know, the Holy Scriptures, 15, 20 times, you know, I had a friend who used to say, I've so read the gospel of John that only, I only need St. John to come and tell me what is right and what is wrong, right? And I'd say, well, no, you haven't because you have a lot of pride. So you haven't been reading the gospel. So um, I didn't like school. And again, my dad would enforce it, you know, you're going to be a doctor. I remember, and I've, I've said this, I've, I've mentioned this in my sermons, my father would walk into the room and I had books all over the place on my table. When he wasn't in the room, I'd have my headphones on and listen to Sargon Gabriel and Whitney Houston <laughs> and Lionel Richie and mimic their, you know, pretending I'm playing the piano and mimicking. As soon as he'd walk in, I'd be, you know, and my dad walked in and he said, Bruni, you know, and I'm going to translate because you know what, if you, if you study all these books and you read them, you're going to be a doctor. I said, Sure thing, that definitely a doctor, right? But I knew that's not going to happen because I didn't like, um, I didn't, I just, I wasn't the bookworm, if you want to call it that. I just, I, 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 I I listen and learn, but yeah, school wasn't my. (laughs) What did you want to do then? You didn't want to pursue it. Well, I wanted. Well, I had, I had, I wanted to be a physician, but without reading any books. (laughs) I wanted to be an insurance salesman. I remember once. God rest us all. My mum uh, said, Bruni, what do you want to do in life? I said, Mum, I'm going to study and become insurance. So I was like, no, you know, uh, I wanted to pursue um, a singing career. Um, <laughs> Talk if my, about that a little bit. <laughs> oh, give or, give or, give or, Dishu, if you're listening. Um, I remember 
um, a group of friends said, listen, we need to get the, get a band together and, um, you know, we'll start performing. So, you know, you'll be our vocalist. I was, yeah, definitely, because I have performed on stage. Charles Tuma, Charles Tuma, the renowned Assyrian singer, he's my cousin. He's my first cousin, Brunt Amti. So, um, twice, I think, no, oh, once it was on a New Year's Eve uh, party that I was his backup singer. And I sang, <laughs> hello, I sang fresh, cooling the gang, and I sang suddenly, Billy Ocean, right? Um, so I loved singing, but again, my dad didn't allow me to pursue singing. Um, and my friends went out and bought all their instruments, and the next thing they saw <laughs> that I was being ordained a deacon, and they were just taken back and thought, why, why, why this, you know? So, yeah. so talk about that. Now you said you want to become a deacon, and I know you were 20 years old. Mm -hmm. So who or what really inspired you to want to take on that responsibility? Well, at that since age? at the age of 11, being in the church, in the choir and performing and emceeing and dramas, very, very much involved in my community, the Assyrian community. I mean, the people in Sydney who I grew with, basically, um, would know, um, you know, um, what I'm talking about. Um, every Sunday at church, then choir. And I was called to be ordained a deacon at the age of, I believe it was around 14 years old. But uh, again, my father um, opposed simply because he said, no, he's too young to be a deacon because, you know, you know, in hindsight, I thank God for my father for a few things. But he's, um, he's you know, he's too young. You know, you ordain, ordain this person a deacon and then what happens when he grows up and he doesn't want to be in what have you. So, um, so it was left off, and I was going to be ordained a deacon with Asha Ashur. He's uh, he's the archdeacon in Rabban Hormuz now, and there was Shamasha David, uh, a few other Shamashe. Um, uh, prior to Marodishu being ordained a deacon, um, so that didn't happen. Um, but I was at church, and I started. I remember I started. Um, uh, what is it? Craving to be a deacon. Now, was it just so I can go into the altar and sing? Because my life's been singing and people, oh, you have a nice, lovely voice and what have you, all glory to God. The gift of praising God that is not singing. Um, I would crave it. Um, so fast forward many years, um, His Grace then Marmilis was uh, appointed at Bishop uh, to the Diocese of Australia. And 1986 it was, um, we got called and... Um, and I was, um, I was uh, elected to be ordained a deacon. And there's a story behind that too, but let's leave. <laughs> yeah. Now looking back, I know you mentioned how your father didn't want you to be a deacon at such a young age and wanted you to be a little bit more mature and kind of um, be able to make that decision also for yourself and take on that responsibility that comes with it. Now looking back, do you agree with him for having you wait? Uh, yes, um, it wasn't my father. I mean, I keep mentioning my father, but it was all the perfect plan and will of God. It was the province of God. Um, you know, when I was called to be ordained a deacon, let me let me tell you the story behind it, and I love sharing it. I just only as a as an encouragement to others and glory to God. Um, the night, the day before, um, his his grace model Odishu, then Kasha Odishu, father Odishu. Um, the day bef the night uh, um, bef the day before he called me, that night I had a dream. I was sitting and conversing with Rabbi Kasha, and Marmilis just comes out of the blue and lays his hand on me and then walks away. And the next day, Kasha Odishu calls me and, and says that, you know, his grace wants to meet with you and a few other people. And it's about the uh, diaconate. So I told my dad I'm going, and, he, and off the bat he said, well, I've told you, you know, no deacon, just if you want to be a reader, that's fine. So, you know, don't get your hopes up, basically. So I went to the meeting and his grace spoke to us and, and I said, yes, your grace, I, agree, I, I accept I would like to be a deacon. So that was one hurdle. The greatest hurdle is coming back home and having the, the whip ready and the belt ready, right? So my dad asked me what happened. I said, well, His Grace uh, has recommended that we become, you know, we, uh, we are ordained deacon and I'm one of the candidates and I've agreed I want to be a deacon. He said, well, I told you that, no, um, you know, you can't be a deacon because da, da, da. And it was during the time where I had met Juliet, and I know you're going to ask about her, and we're going to be engaged as well to be married. So that night, 
I amazed everyone. Like my sisters and my brother-in-law's eyes were popping out. Like, <laughs> what are you doing, Jenard? You can't re- you can't speak back to your father like that. So I remember he said, "Okay, go to sleep now. You know, um, don't get carried away. Go to sleep. I'll talk to you in the morning." Kristen, when I before I went to bed, and I used to always pray. By the way, I used to always pray and always read my scriptures. I kneeled and I prayed and I said, "Lord." And I, I always, I, you know, verbatim, Lord, if you are calling me, not one thousand, not one Nathan, my dad's name, right, God's rest is always Nathan, not one Nathan, but if a thousand Nathans um, oppose you, you will, it will be your will. I had a vision, I had a vision that I was being laid and ordained as they ordained bishops. And a big light, I saw this great, huge, luminous light, and I could feel footsteps on my back. I was crying out, you know, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, and I just snapped out of it. And from that point onwards, I knew that I'm going to um, also um, enter the priesthood. So in the morning, I got up, and Dad said, you know, last night you got carried away. I said, yeah, but I still want to be a deacon. He said, okay, go to work, go to work before I deal with you the way I deal with you. Anyway, I called Pasha and everything. But, but listen, this was my dad's reasoning. You know, sometimes, beloved um, youth, sometimes parents may seem unreasonable. Sometimes parents may seem that they don't know what they're talking about. But you got to stop and think, well, maybe God's using them. Maybe not the method, but God's using them. When, when Qasha Odishu asked my dad, what's the problem? He said, Rabi, I'll be more than... It's a privilege for me, more than pleased to have my son be ordained deacon. But he's going to get married soon. Will his wife be a deacon, deaconess with him, meaning he has to be in church every Sunday to fulfill his role? And, you know, then being at the age of, um, was it 20? I felt this man knows what he's talking about. So I called her and everything. You know, I was and what struggles at that time? You're 20, you just became a deacon. What kind of struggles were you enduring? You're somebody that is in, involved in the church, but you have friends that are maybe not involved in the church or may, might not have um, a position as you did as a deacon within the church. What kind of struggles were you enduring? You know, um, Kristen, my friendship, my circle of friends was also had to be authenticated by my father. I wasn't permitted to um, to go out with any person. Um, so I'm not saying I didn't have friends. I had plenty of <laughs> friends. Um, I didn't have any struggles really with friends. The only thing, the only thing that was, I'd say, a little uncomfortable is what uh, Saint Paul writes in Romans chapter one verse. Sorry, chapter six verse twenty one. And what fruit do you have then, of which today you are ashamed? for its result is death, right? So, you know, when people would see me and say, oh, you're a deacon now, but, you know, we used to be out, we used to go to the swimming pool and we used to do whatever, so now you're a deacon, right? You know, but but then again, the positive uh, point of that was many of my friends would say, you know what, good on you, um, uh, Shamasha, back then, good on you, Shamasha, you know, you took the right path. Yeah, we're still in the world. We're da da da, and and most of my friends ended up in the church too. So, praise God. I remember one uh, one very close friend. God rest his soul, Lecter Dennis. Um, we're very close. And if Ray Issue is listening to this, um, he said to me, "You know what, Rabbi? Out of all of us, our group, you know, you took the right path, and I envy you." But he was an amazing Christian, um, and he was uh, he was uh, a very faithful, active Christian, a very influential Christian um, uh, in the lives of many as well. And I think it's beautiful how God works in mysterious ways, mm. that how he could use you through this path that you're now taking to also encourage the friends that you have or your family, whoever, to kind of pursue um, wanting to get to know God and mm. work within the church as well in different calibers. You know, the scriptures say in 1 Corinthians, God uses the foolish, and and truly he did, because when, when my friends would see me, I think, Robbie, you, you know, Shamash, you're going to be a singer and da 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 and what have you. But, you know, well, you know, God comes out and looks for those who are on rubbish tips, rubbish dumps, and He takes them off the rubbish dumps and puts them, plants them in the garden of the church, you know. And um, that's a testimony itself. That's God's uh, gracious love, grace, mercy 
that he does not really truly he does not uh, he's not pleased with the death of a sinner until he returns and lives so yeah. and you were a deacon for 17 years looking back 16 or 16 years <laughs> looking back and now what lessons did you Kristen, you're not going to ask phase? for my social security number right? I already did just that's a disclaimer I'll share it on the, on the Instagram I'm comments I'm sorry I'm sorry <laughs> well what what lessons did you learn during from that time? from being from just alone being a deacon and living in society and having all these friends and so forth mm -hmm. looking back now on that phase of your life mm -hmm. what's um, something that you took away from it um, well remember I became a deacon and when I was ordained deacon, one week after that was my engagement. I was being engaged to, to Juliet, and then we got married uh, two years after that. Um, so during my diaconate, I was a married deacon. However, you know, and I got a, and this is this is a testimonial interview, and we need to be open and and true um, with respects to everything that I say. Um, during my time at ch at church, um, there was no um, you know formation of youth as far as um, you know Bible studies and spiritual events like for example we have worship night here we have bible studies uh, you know every week and we're adults bible studies youth bible studies that wasn't provided back then actually the first bible studies per se where we would sit and um, discuss the holy scriptures um, began um, when i was the president of the youth at the at mat mariam in saint hermes cathedral and we would sit, but really without any background knowledge or training, I would uh, lead Bible studies. But something that's, that still today boggles my mind, and, and, and I just ascribe praise and glory to God. What I used to speak back then, reading the church fathers today, I see that, hey, I was, I was on the right path. You know, I wasn't wrong because, again, God was leading. Okay. So we didn't have all these formation and, and, you know, spirituality. It was just, you're a deacon, you do your service, um, you're, you're, you, you're in the youth, you have to do activities and socializing, a little bit of Bible studies here and there and, and what have you, you know. Until, until 2000 and I would say 2001, um, is when we we began this Bible studies and spiritual nights and prayer meetings and and what have you. So during my diaconate, I was a deacon, I was a, well, a husband, and I was a, a father as well. So not much formation, not not much um, um, training, you know. But His Grace, when His Grace Marmilus arrived, he immediately began preaching, and I would be the. I would record the sermons and I would make copies of cassette tapes back then. <laughs> At work, I had a... Stephen, I had one of those te uh, cassette plays where you can... Rec I had two and I would take all my cassettes there and during serving my <laughs> serving the customers, I would be recording um, cassettes. And I've, I've picked up a lot of um, my knowledge from His Grace and His sermons as well. So now, let's paint the scene again. You're 37 years old. You're living in <laughs> Australia. You've been married now for 15 years and you have a young daughter. What happened that made you want to take on the role of priesthood? I know you mentioned a little bit of that calling you had mm -hmm. when you became a deacon, mm -hmm. you knew you would be a priest, but why at that point, you're 37, mm -hmm. why at that time? Um, yes, you're absolutely right. When I was being ordained deacon, and by the, time, uh, by the way, when I was being ordained deacon, I was injured. My, my, I had chopped my finger off with a lawnmower, so you see my <laughs> pictures. and. There is a picture that really hits me and, and touches my heart is, you know, I spoke a lot about my father, but there is a picture where I had to tie my shoelaces, my, um, my shoes I would wear for the altar. There is a picture of my dad kneeling down and tying my shoelaces. Wow. All right. and, and, and I was being ordained a deacon. From that point onwards, I knew I, I started again craving and wanting to be a priest. His Grace asked me once, he said, Shamasha, why do you want to be a, pri uh, a priest for? I said, I want to serve. I want to be a servant. He said, but you are a servant. You're a deacon. That means a servant. I said, I want to be a servant of the servants. 
Mm-hmm. And, and the drive behind it was, I want to preach. I want to evangelize, you know. Um, the late uh, Mardenha, blessed memory, uh, came to Australia once and, and I was ordained a priest and he said, I said, you know what, Cassie, I don't want to be tied to a parish. I want to go out, I want to missionize, I, I want to do missionary work, you know, established parishes. And he goes, oh, you want to be St. Paul? <laughs> I said, well, yeah, I don't know if I can fill those shoes, but something like that. And that's where he, he when he wrote me a, a, a blessing, a letter of blessing, he calls me Kahana Evangelayat Eitad Madancha, the Evangelical Priest of the Assyrian Church of the East. Mm-hmm. From that point onwards, I wanted to serve, I wanted to, um, you know, be entrusted with a flock and to, to attend to the flock and... Um, and yeah, Marmilis asked me, and, and uh, that was my answer. And, but I didn't get an ordination then. I don't know why, but <laughs> maybe it wasn't a satisfying answer back then. <laughs> so when you did become a priest, what was your family's reaction when mm-hmm. you told them you wanted to take on that path? And mm-hmm. I think this is a good gateway to reflect on the life of a wife of a priest and mm-hmm. how much, Juliet, your wife has helped you through that journey. Are you going to be specifically asking me about Juliet, or would you like me to talk about her now? It's free for you. It's free. This, <laughs> Go ahead. This free is my for all. <laughs> I'm just um, a guest. <laughs> okay. I don't want to sit here and brag about my wife and put on a, uh, a pedestal, and but I do want to say that when I pray, if I don't enter the kingdom of heaven because of my foolishness, <laughs> I pray that the Lord will grant her the kingdom of heaven. Mm. You know, in the Lebanese language, they say khuri, which means priest, and the priest wife is khuria. This woman, um, by the way, we, we were separated. When we got engaged, we were separated because her, her, fa- her brother was killed in the war between Iran and Iraq. We were separated for a year. And then again, my father wanted me to get married. And he was, he was going around, shopping around for me and going around asking for uh, hands in marriage. And I said, you know, take it back. I don't want it. What have you? Um, when, I, when, when we were separated, I knew it was in my heart, the conscience. God's telling me, no, 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 she, it has to be her. Because I'm going to call you to priesthood and you need a priestess. And from the time I was a deacon, I was so involved in the church. Juliet truly, and this is not just a, a, um, a cliche, she has been the mother and the father of the two children we had. I was always with the youth. Um, I remember she only complained once. I joined the youth soccer team. <laughs> Kristen, I scored this goal from halfway. I was trying to pass it, but anyway, it went in. It was a goal. Anyway. I love it. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, yeah. I know, it's called fluke, actually. Yeah, yeah. Um, from that point onwards, the only time she's complained is just once and said, why do you need to play soccer? Because you need to take care of the girl, Melissa. I'm at work. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and she was right. I She would be ready for her and I to go out. And the priest the parish priest would call me and say we're going to go visit people i would actually call her already to go and say i can't make it i'm going out. she never complained right she was in the, we met each other in the in the choir i was the choir conductor and she was the choir singer right so i'm not going to go going to go too much into you know how i asked her to marry it's okay, me. Go ahead. <laughs> all right well i gave her a card once a sunday after church i gave her my um i used to work at the commonwealth bank um, gave her my card and I said, listen, give me a call. I, I want to talk to you. Oh, yeah. And she thought it was about a job. <laughs> so she told her mom, her late mom, Adam Anichle, she said, oh, uh, Jenhard uh, has called me, he give me, given me his card to call him. She said, oh, call him, maybe it's about a, a job here. You know? So she called me and I said, <laughs> and I'm going to do this. She's going to hate me for this, but I'll do this. I call, she called me and I said, listen, I'm interested in you, da-da-da, and I you know, I know that you're not the, you're, you're, you haven't been brought up to go out and you know, go on a holiday with your fiance and your boyfriend, what have you. I know that, you know, I mean marriage, so think about it. I'll give you a week. Kristen, I said, I'll give you a week. She <laughs> ran me in three days and said, I accept. Oh. <laughs> but anyway, so, so she, and, and then that night I called her about being a deacon. Um, she was so, she was over the moon. She said, of course, why would I want to, like, this is a dream to have a deacon in the house. And then when I, 
you know, I, I, I have dropped the ball many times being a human being as a shamasha as well. I've done a few things that, and I don't want to go into those too much. Um, nothing serious, like nothing <laughs> serious. Um, I've been very faithful. So, um, But when I said to her that I, you know, I've been called to be a priest, she basically, I think her words were, so what's new? I mean, this was in, inevitable. We could see this coming because I was so involved in the church. Um, I was the unofficial secretary to the bishop. I had the choir. I had the church radio program. I was the um, chair of the boards of the school, the St. Hermes Sassoon Primary School, um, president of the youth group, um, deacon, and here, there, and everywhere. So when I did, bec when I, when I, not I decided when God said now is the time I had the full support of my family my auntie Shalom Charles Tuma's uh, mother I remember um, I said Atu um, I'm going to be a you know priest she goes hey, and she was the first one who saw my cloak the mm -hmm. Ma'apra I remember it was in the in the car it was uh, Saturday I had to go and pick up something I said Atu Atu come and go. Because my auntie is very dear to me. Um, I said, I have to come and look at my... And she started kissing. <laughs> and, um, and the night, the, that night, Kristen, that night, I had another dream that I was being elevated in front of St. Hermes uh, Cathedral. Mm. I said, Atu, I had this dream. He goes, well, there it is. You're going to be elevated. Your, your ranking is going to be elevated. I had the full support of all of my family. Um, and they were, they were like, you know, we were, we were waiting for this. It was, you know. It was going to happen sooner or later. So, Rabbi, you mentioned a lot about the ministries you were involved in in Australia. Mm -hmm. Talk about the prison ministry. It's something you didn't mention. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Where did you get your information from? We have our sources. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, the prison ministry, a very um, significant ministry of, um, of the many ministries that I was involved in. Um, we began that, I can't pinpoint the, the date or the year, but... Um, I remember visiting um, one brother who was in jail for, you know, nothing very serious, but, um, um, and uh, the parents approached me and said, you know, Rabbi, would you be willing to go to a prison? I said, oh, of course. I mean, Jesus, Jesus mentions that I was in prison and you did not visit me. So when I, when we, when we went and um, actually I went by myself and, and visited the person and you know what you do, you got to be careful what you say because everything's recorded. So we only, uh, you know, we only, I concentrated on, you know, giving hope and, uh, and talking about grace and mercy, talking about the law, according to the law, you should be not out of here, but there's grace and there's mercy. And after that, I thought, you know, this is a great ministry. So um, I wrote to um, uh, a lot of the prison chap chaplains. And basically they said, listen, Father, it's not easy to become a chaplain. Just don't go through all that, you know, trouble. Any time you want to come and visit someone, you just call me and I will arrange it with the head guard, whatever their name is. And, and you'll, f you know, feel free to come and visit your people. So it was effective. And you know, something amazing, Kristen, um, many times the first question was, so uh, you, so you're telling me God's going to forgive me for what I've done? You know, and you're talking about uh, murder, you're talking about um, drugs and, you know, um, extortions and what have you. So uh, you tell me that God's going to forgive me for what I've done? I said, that's exactly what I'm here to tell you. Beautiful. You know, yeah. society may never forgive you, but so what do I need to do? Well, you know, reach out to the Lord, cry out to the Lord, um, be prepared to repent, and, and what have you. you know. I, I, I think I still have a brother who's, um, who I knew from a very, very young age. He's still serving time. And that was the question. Is I said, listen, you're going to be here for a long time. You know that very well. But use that time. And don't forget, 1,000 years is one day. I remember specifically saying that to him. 1,000 years is like one day to God. So, you know, use your time to, to reconcile with God. And it was, it's a very good ministry. Is there an interaction that still you remember to this day with somebody you spoke with and something maybe they, they told you and how much their life changed through this ministry? It was this person, this, this inmate that I went visit and the first thing he said, he actually he looked at me because I knew him from me and I said, you know, hi, how are you? It was good. I said, well, you know, here we are, like, yeah. And he was like, yes, I know you. You're here to tell me that God's going to forgive me. Do you think he will forgive me? That's what he asked me. I, you know, I, I had to hold it because I was going to crumble myself, you know. And I said, that's exactly what I'm here to tell you. 
I'm not here to tell you it's okay, you know, I'm going to help to get, you know, I'm not here to do that. It's not okay. You're here now. This is reality. Face reality. But there is always hope with Jesus Christ, you know. And and I hear um, that some of these inmates that I did visit, some of them have, have you know, been released. And some are in the church. Um, they're active in the church as well, so. And with that being said, people think the life of a priest is much easier than that of a parishioner. You, that in a sense, you're bulletproof. You don't have struggles. You don't fall into temptations or so forth. What struggles specifically maybe in your first five years of your now vocation of being a priest were you enduring? Which, that transition now from, in a sense, you're more of a parishioner. You were just a deacon. to now having a position of authority. You're now leading a flock. What were you trying to overcome? Or the struggles you're trying to overcome at that time. I have I have not overcome anything yet, Kristen. I still struggle, and one of the, one of the greatest characteristics of Christ um, is humility. You know, Jesus didn't find a place to be born. He was born in a stable full of dung, and that's humility. We spoke about that last program, I think. Um, um, humility and perseverance. You know, I always say faith entails faith obviously trust and patience and perseverance these are the 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 four um, attributes that i could be speaking on behalf of very other priests i don't know but that we all go through um it's not easy Kristen, because um you know, we have some difficult people in the flock and christ encountered difficult his opponents were just so difficult they didn't budge he was on the cross he was he just said give me some water and they gave him guile to drink right um and then you have demanding people and there were demanding people when jesus was uh you know lord tell my brother to um to you know split half the inter inheritance and jesus says who who told you that i've been put to be you know i'm i'm the arbitrator yeah. and then you have those people that are so um, down in life that are so helpless so you have to be everything to everyone and then you have your own struggles personal struggles family struggles health issues you know just before we began this uh, pro uh, program um, Adrena said something and I said Oh, she, I, I said something about my having a little bit of pain here and then. She goes, oh, I said, yeah, so when you want to cry, you come to me and cry. Who do I cry to? She goes, oh, he's my, he's my shoulder. You can cry to, you know. Who do we cry to when we have, um, when we have issues? Obviously, we cry to the Lord, mm -hmm. you know. But um, the struggles are always going to be there. And as far as I'm concerned, for me to overcome, I'm, I've put this in motion in practice the past three weeks now. See, we're not perfect. Uh, you know, I didn't, I didn't become bulletproof as, uh, as soon as I was ordained priest. What I try to now, as personally, and maybe this is a, 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 a help to us, is always remember what St. Paul says. Always think yourselves as being less than others. So if you and I have an argument, and I know I'm right, I must say to myself, well, no, maybe it was my fault. It gives you so much peace and comfort as well. You know, so struggles are always there um, and temptations um, many ways, um, not as a, a faithful and a, a parishioner, uh, but the pride factor is always there. The, um, uh, the you know, being right at all times. Um, so we go through that. Mm -hmm. So now kind of moving to 2010, you moved from Australia to America. Hey, <laughs> Woohoo. So briefly explain that transition from Australia to America, specifically the Central Valley of California, and why. 2009, His Grace, now His Holiness Marawa was ordained bishop. His first, the first Eucharistic service. His grace then, Marava, celebrated, was the English Raza in Sydney at St. John's Park Hall. It was a school hall. That was his first mm -hmm. service. Um, apparently, I wasn't at that meeting. Apparently, his grace, Marawa, his beatitude, Marmilis, 
because his grace accompanied uh, the late Mardancha for the um, the consecration of Marmiz to the ranking of Archbishop. And the late Marnarse were chilling out, as they say, and Marnarse threw this idea, you know, you should take Kasha Janart and take him to uh, Central Valley because we had that issue with the churches back in 2006. I don't want to go into that. And, you know, he's, he's, he'll help you, you know, establish youth and, you know, he can be an assistant to you. And, and so Marava entertained the idea and, and actually refer, uh, you know, asked Marmila, said, are you, this, man, this man's your right hand, are you okay with that? And Marmila thought about it a little and thought, you know what, yeah, I'll manage one year or maybe one and a half years, I'll manage. So um, that's when it started. And I remember uh, specifically His Holiness, the late Mardancha, was sitting down and we, we entered the room and we greeted him and uh, received blessings. And uh, Marava went first and then I was behind him. Mar Mar Mardancha said, Ala Manichle, Ha, Tila Kashuk. They had already cooked it and it was all ready to go. It just had to be tasted. So, um, yeah, and, and you know, um, I remember Marmila said, or oh, Marava, was it? Um, you need to ask Gillette. I said, Gillette's fine, don't worry. <laughs> Gillette is fine. She's been nothing young, but it was, it was, it was, it was meant to be for one year mm -hmm. to, to come and help uh, the diocese, which was um, a little um, wounded uh, back in 2010. So you're now in the beautiful Central Valley of mm -hmm. California. Yeah. What ministry were you involved in? Well, the first thing, um, obviously, my main concern was the youth. I was uh, I was called to work um, and to start, you know, assisting the youth. So, the first um, um, first move was to establish some committees. Uh, the first one was the diocese and youth core group, entailed youth members of all the parishes in the diocese, including Marnarse and Mariosip as well. I remember I called all the youth presidents, Hala, uh, Shamasha Ammo, and Shamasha Antoine was the youth president here at Marade. Just gathering information like, what are you lacking? What would you like to see? What's your issues and what have you? So I went back to His Grace and I remember His Grace had a re little retreat in his bedroom. Um, it had a whiteboard. I said, Kessi, tu? Listen, and I started writing, you know, I always like to write and I said, I think we should organize this, da, 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 da. And um, His Grace was um, very positive and we, as he actually, not myself, he approved the establishment of the Diocese and Youth Core Group, DCRG. We always had those <laughs> always have, acronyms, yeah. Oh, right? Yeah. yeah, master of the acronyms. Oh, yes, you are. Um, <laughs> and then, <laughs> thanks, Kristen. <laughs> yeah, okay. But... Um, a few years down the a few years down the track, um, um, you know, it was seen that it's difficult for the Bay Area to be involved, and they would like to do their own thing. I think um, my brother Kasha Lawrence had requested that he would like to take care of the youth because you know, um, you know, it was, it, it, the travel distance, what have you. Um, and then we established the Central Valley Youth Core Group, Core group yeah. Youth Group CVYG. Um, but at that time, also. If you all recall the debt reduction and development campaign, yeah. that idea I bought from Sydney because when I was when I did come to Australia to uh, the United States, we had already kicked that off. Um, we we had done the same campaign there as well, and again when His Grace saw the figures and my brother priest and said, you know, we need we need to push this and so but but focusing mainly on the on the youth and establishing the Central Valley Youth core group. It's funny that you mentioned the whiteboard because you still do that today. You, I'm literally Stick looking man. at the whiteboard behind yeah. me. You love to do that. But talk a little bit about the Central Valley Youth Group. You have been a huge advocate, a helper, pain, a father, a pain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, but um, you're someone very important to the Central Valley Youth Group. So talk about that a little bit. Um. You know, my ministry since, uh, you know, being involved in the youth in Sydney at the age of 19, you know, when I tell people I'm 56, oh, mashallah, yeah, exactly, so you're <laughs> knocking on wood, right? What? What do you do? I said, nothing, I just work with the youth. As as um, problematic as, as, I don't, I, I've got to be careful with the choice of my words. Edit it. <laughs> as they are, I love the youth. 
I I really, you know, I, and I'm glad I'm still the old fashioned Shamasha Jinnard. And when I see youth get involved in a few things, you know, my terminology is old now. Sometimes when I first came here, I used to use the the street terminology, and everyone, oh, he's a cool dude, yeah. Now he's used the same terms again. What's that? <laughs> All right. Um, I love the youth because. I don't believe they are the future. I believe they are um, the past, the present, and the future of the, a nation, a church, and what have you. Um, so when I met uh, the youth here, um, and I saw that, unfortunately, due to many circumstances, um, they were deprived of so many things that we had in Sydney. And, and, uh, and I spoke, I was constantly consulting with His Grace, and I said, we need to do this, and I'd like to establish this. You know, worship night, we established uh, 12, uh, no, yeah. uh, probably 10 years yeah. ago. His Grace actually uh, uh, presented on the first one, if you remember. Um, we did that in Sydney. We called it Friday evening uh, um, preaching. And we had the Wednesday Bible studies evening, where we would sit and discuss the Bible, obviously, study the, the scriptures. So, and I saw a lot of things that we, we would do in Sydney that the youth weren't getting, uh, you know, involved in here. So it was, a, it was a, a mission, but it was God's work. And today, when I see people like yourself, and not because you're interviewing me, um, people like um, Katrina, my sister Katrina, and many others who are now leading Bible studies, I mean, quietly under the table, I go, yes, that's what that's what it was all about. Praise your name, Lord God, you know. Um, and we, we, we're not there. We have a long way to go. But, um, you know, Kristen, I believe that, um, uh, you know, the, the, the events of the world today and the path that the world is taking we need to, a, a a church needs to exhaust time effort and finances not only for the youth but to begin from the young at the at the young age the the, the children exactly yeah just specifically i guess with your role within the youth you touched on a lot of things but out of all of those what do you love most about helping with the youth group you had one thing you the had fun to we have the fun oh yeah we have a lot of that <laughs> the maltashe and the, is it going ram right the yeah and the, and what else do we have what's number are you? what's number are you <laughs> by the way what's number are you krista 25 <laughs> she got it <laughs> um it's it's seeing them grow you know again when i 2010 how old were you krista 15 15 you're a young girl, right? Um, but now here you are interviewing um, <laughs> that unworthy servant of God who arrived in here back in 2010, um, seeing those that are now married with children, like Maggie and, and many others. Um, it gives me so much um, joy in the spirit and to praise the Lord and say, Lord, your, your works are truly amazing, truly amazing. You know, and the youth have played a very big role in my life in many ways. The youth have disciplined me. The youth have taught me to see it in many ways and not just my way. And I truly say this. The youth have taught me to be long bearing and to be patient and to um, to just go along and continue to rely on God and not my own understanding. Um, and to date, this is still happening. So, thank you, youth. So, what are you? Youth, or as Raman Batsayad would say, Yutamute. <laughs> <laughs> you still say that today. <laughs> <laughs> what are your expectations and visions for the youth of the 21st century? Oh, you know, I'd like to see the youth. Um, engage in more spirituality than what the world has to offer. I'd like to see the youth truly commit their lives to Jesus Christ. And I'd like to see the youth give everything they have that have been blessed with from God, give it back to Christ. I'd like to see the youth take over the church with all respects now. If it wasn't for our parents, we would not be here. You know, when I see old priests 
And people will say, oh, the old priests, they never preached. They, you know, if it wasn't for them, I wouldn't be here. I actually kiss their hand. I, I thank them. I say, thank you. Because if it wasn't for you, I may not have been here today. But I'd like to see the youth get involved in the church to run the church. Not only administrative and financials, not only that. I'd like to see the youth in, you know, the, the, the young men to... To, to, to crave for rankings, to, to take, you know, uh, uh, different church orders and, and offices and, and the, the, my sisters to be involved in the church where they're teaching the youngies and becoming, you know, mentors and, and Sunday school and, and uh, you know, the youth itself. Um, it just, it's, got, it's a chain reaction, you know. You're, you need to now, Kristen, you need to now, people like yourself, Maggie, your Rosie, Gabby, Katrina, um, Adrina, Stephen, Joey, um, you know, I'm sorry I can't mention everyone, we'll be here till tomorrow, to now come back and give back to the church what the church has given them, to be exactly. mentors, you know. And, and you guys do that, and, I, and that's what I like to see, and, I, and, and I, I do witness that every now and then, which is great. And we honestly, Gabby, we're, are blessed to have you, someone that helps us because... It's something definitely difficult for us, and we're trying to give back just as much as the church has given back to us. Um, but we can't do it without, you know, your support. But how much do I know you guys? Come on. Yeah, you know us. <laughs> I think very, very well. Yeah, Adrian is calling a lot. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Next time you come and knock on my door. <laughs> so now we're kind of to present day. At this point, you've been a priest for almost twenty years. You're a parish priest. You hold an executive position in the National Youth Association. You're the coordinator of the local youth ministry. You have a podcast ministry. You're a husband, a father, and the best of all, you're a grandfather. So, <laughs> so you wear a lot of hats. Mm -hmm. What struggles do you endure today? And when I say that again, it's, for example, as parishioners, we're living in this society. We go through many challenges. We feel that a lot of times we're the only ones enduring these difficulties, temptations, loss of hope faith really fighting to stay afloat so what do you somebody that has all those hats struggle with sometimes it's staying focused and again and the greatest struggle is wanting things to go where i think is right how i think is correct and the time that i think is mm -hmm. you know appropriate and I get so many eggs on my faces because I come back and I say, you know, I can hear it through my, again, the conscience and the scriptures and my, even my sermons when sometimes I'm preaching. And I always uh, give this disclaimer, you know, when I preach, I'm preaching to myself first. It's like God saying, relax, listen, this is not your church. You are an unworthy servant. Remember, you used to smoke and you wanted to become a singer and you would go out and, and you know, with your friends to the public swimming pools and you would do the Burjit Bawal in the, in the water. Oh, that's going back. That's going back. Um, Let's talk about remember, that. <laughs> remember you, you stole a textbook once and you almost got caught, but you were so clever. You took it out of your bag, showed the bag, put the bag down and put the book back again. So you were a thief. Right? Remember you used to cuss so much, so you were a, a, a blasphemer, right? Remember you used to hate, so you became a murderer, because he who hates his brother is a murderer. Hey, remember you were on that rubbish dump, which you were so um, worthy of being there? Remember I took you from there and I put you at the altar where you open your arms and you invoke the Holy Spirit to come down. It's not you. So... Relax, you know, just as God said to Elijah, get up, stop whinging, you got more work to do. Relax, it's my church, it's my timing, it's my way, and it's the way I want, because Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You know, that's my struggle. So, and that, that's, that's a prayer point for, uh, I ask for everyone to pray for me. And I think that's evidence alone, because we go through many of the similar struggles that you mentioned, mm -hmm. and just alone, you know, we always want our way, our time. Mm. You know, when we pray for something and it might not happen, it can obviously be discouraging and you have that loss of hope and mm -hmm. faith. Um, you start questioning a lot. So just to know, to like you said, relax and know that everybody is going through that and just to trust the process and trust in what God has put before you is the best thing for you. Let me tell you, um, Kristen, I'm sorry to cut you short. No, no. Um, when I posted this post of St. John Chrysostom, 
um, I was going through that struggle back then. This is only a few, um, a few weeks ago. Um, St. John Chrysostom writes, when your prayers, I'm trying to find a post so I can read it verbatim, but along the lines, when your prayers are not answered, um, and um, or something along the lines, um, when your prayers are not answered, do not think that you are more wise than God. Just wait. All right. That day I posted that. That was for me. But I want to share it with everyone. Because I was struggling with something. Like, why isn't it happening? Like, and then I pick up the ch church fathers. And I, 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 I truly recommend, strongly recommend for you, for everyone to read the writings of the church fathers. They're amazing. And when I read that, I thought, okay, that's another slap in the face. So relax. Hey, you know what? I'm going to post this for myself so that I can always refer back to it and for others as well. So when someone is feeling similar to um, mm. a lot of the examples that you mentioned, you know, feeling down, whatever it may be, what is your advice for them? You touched on a little bit about it to pick up. Let me go back in a life example. We were married. We were living in apartments. We had Melissa. We had 50 cents in our bank account. And Juliet was crying and like, what are we going to do? And why am I, why are we like this? Look at this person, look at that person. And yeah, we always say that, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, look yes. at this person, look at that person. I specifically remember, if she can recall, I said, hey, <laughs> <laughs> Good start. Sure, hey, God doesn't love that person more than he loves you and I. God will provide. And a few weeks down the track, all the bills were paid and we had more money in the bank account. More than 50 cents anyway. Trust the process. Always. God does not show partiality. He has a perfect plan. Perfect timing. And it always happens, Kristen. When it happens, we always say, oh, thank God. Oh, <laughs> look at when it happened. Oh, it's perfect timing. But a few months before that, we were whinging. Almost wanted to throw in the towel, right? Wait for the Lord. Be still and know that I am your God. You know, God came down, took on flesh, God incarnate, so that he could be born in a stable of dung and it could be spat at for you and I. How much more evidence do we want that God loves us? Just be patient and wait for the Lord. Even if we're struggling, you know, I always I take a lot of heart from Job. Job didn't denounce God, but he cursed the day he was born. He was like, why am I, what am I doing here? But he never denounced his Lord. He never rejected his God. And I think it's verse 38 or is it 28? God says, okay, let's talk now. And he, he said two words and Job basically zipped it and said, no, Lord, that's it. I, you're done. You know, I'm done. And he said, no, 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 let's keep talking. Where were you when I created heavens and earth? You know, so. With all that being said, what is the best part of your vocation? Best part mm -hmm. is when I stand at the altar and I extend my most puny and weak arms, unworthy, and invoke the Holy Spirit to ascend on the bread and wine. And spiritually, mysteriously, they become the body and blood of, blood of Christ. When I announce that such a person is baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Spirit. When I'm immersing them in the water, I'm putting them death to, to death with Christ in baptism and I'm being, and, and giving them new life. Not me, through me, but only through Jesus Christ, by Jesus Christ. When I lay my hand on a person and beseech the Lord to send his Holy Spirit and it happens. When I pray on people and I ask the Lord to heal and to forgive, when I give absolution, and, and please, I know we're going to get these, when I say I, it's not the I factor. I'm not glorifying myself. This is my personal joy. Is when I, by the power vested in me through Jesus, through the grace of Jesus Christ, announce that a person is forgiven through Christ, I always step back and say, my God, through me? That child just received new life through me. That couple is now one body through me. And then I come back and say, well, Lord, I truly am not worthy. And you know, the psalm says, to you glory, only to you, not to me, to you only, Lord, be glory. 
With all that you see happening in today's society, what is the most difficult part of your vocation? Let me be a politician and answer your question <laughs> with a question. What is the most difficult struggle or you know um, temptation, whatever you go through, of being a, uh, a faithful Christian in this world? Always trusting. I think that's one of the biggest struggles that I have is always trusting in the process and trusting. Um, I have faith in God and know that whatever he puts before me is always for the benefit of my life and those around me. But sometimes in the moment, I think it becomes easier said than done. And you kind of touched upon it earlier and you said, you know, we want things our way, our time. And we feel like, you know, sometimes we know what's best for us, mm -hmm. which is not the case. So when something does end up going in a different way than we hope and pray for, we just need to relax, like you even said that earlier, mm -hmm. just to relax and trust in the Lord and have faith that whatever way He takes us, that He will equip us to be able to persevere and become stronger, even though we might not think in our human limited mindset that that's what's going to come from it. You've just answered your question on my behalf. That is the <laughs> difficult part of the vocation, to emphasize and to bring people to that true understanding and firm standing that everything will pass away. Only Jesus Christ is the, the imp most important factor. Jesus Christ is of yesterday, is of today, and eternity, praise be to his name. You know, he says in Luke chapter 21, verse 33, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words shall not pass away. So when we read Jesus' words, I mean, yes, we have the comforting words, we have the alarming words, but those final alarming words, that one day, Kristen, you and I, and every person that is on this earth, the trillions and gazillions of people that have walked walked this earth will stand before this righteous judgment and be judged according to their deeds, faith and deeds, whether good or evil. Amen. That is the most difficult part of the vocation to, you know, stress to people and emphasize that this is where this world is heading. So where are we? What are we doing? You know, I'm not one of those, if Jesus was to come tomorrow, what, what would you say? Where would you go? Where would you be? You know, I'm, you know, Jesus says, worry about today. Tomorrow has its own problems. Mm -hmm. I'm one of those who would say, where are we today? Let's fix today and God willing tomorrow, God will take care of. And to add on to what you're saying about wanting to fix today, I do worry for the new generation. We have a lot going on in society, a lot of things that are against our Christian faith. So trying to, you know, be somebody that is part of the society, but as well continuing to pursue this Christian faith can be difficult and it can lead to a lot of confusion, a lot of challenges, a lot of um, difficulties. But when we are close to the church, it just makes it um, a little bit easier in a sense that we have the support of others that you know are like-minded and pursuing that same path that we are so they can support us. God so graciously granted us the free will, Kristen. Um, but it's what do we do with that free will? Correct. You know, I can, I can place a knife in a murderer's hand and he will murder. But I can place a knife in a physician's hand and he will heal people. Let's be the physicians. Mm -hmm. Let's use our free will for the glory of God, first and foremost, for, our sal for the salvation of, of, of souls and for our salvation. Um, you know, we, I, I think we tend to use this free will. We've, we've so taken it out of context and so uh, liquefied it. You know, I'm, I'm free to do what I want. Well, well, yes, you are, but there are consequences. You know, I remember asking my brother-in-law, once we were driving, I said, John, um, I can kill people. I can murder people. He goes, no, I was a shamash. He goes, no, no, you can't. I said, why? No, he wants to. You know, it's like, uh, he used to go, uh. I said, I can. I can go out there and, and buy a weapon, obtain a weapon and just murder people. I can do that. But should you? But should I? He goes, no, you shouldn't. I said, why? Because, well, that's murder. I said, but you see, I have the free will. I can do that, but I will choose not to do that. I will choose to do, to heal people rather than, you know, uh, uh, 
harm people. Heal people, not harm people. There's a maxim. Mm -hmm. Let's all heal people and not harm people. How's that, Adrina? There you go. Yes, make Great. the right choice. And Rabi, we have reached the tail end of our episode and I only have like 15 more questions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just a few more questions. I'm getting out of here. I know, right? Sit down, sit down. <laughs> no, so one of my questions for you for the close off is who has been the most influential person in your life? Who has been? First and foremost, praise and glory be to his name, our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ. On this earth. <laughs> um, I mean, it, you know, it goes without saying. But I'd really like to make mention of one beloved brother who um, was the cause of the turning point of my understanding of being a deacon, being in the church. His name is Ninos Harun. Um, I remember when we began the English ministries in Australia, um, the first meeting we had, um, Ninos Harun was a brother who would, I'd see in the church, oh, his dad, the late Kasha Gewergis Harun, he would be in church every Sunday, but I wouldn't see him at all. They would uh, attend other churches for Bible studies because there was no Bible studies, effective Bible studies back then. And I was one of the cause of that, not effective Bible studies. I remember that first meeting we had when he when he entered the hall and a few other people with him. I thought, ooh, Ninos is back. And when I was a Shamasha then, and when he left, he shook my hand. He goes, Shamasha, we're going to make this work. Wow. And to date, um, this beloved brother of mine has been a, an amazing support. Um, I I yearn for his love for his church and his nation, his biblical knowledge, his scriptural knowledge, his capability, his gift of the gab. Um, sometimes he talks so much he won't let you talk, but we love him. And, you know, the six of his ear, he knows what I'm talking about. Um, um, he has been very, very influ influential from the beginning of my priestly ministry in Sydney for the Saints Peer and Paul Parish. Wow, that's amazing to have somebody that has such a mm. has had such an influence on you and really helped you continue this mm. endeavor through helping in the church. Mm. My other question is, what hobbies do you love? I know you always mention soccer, but other than that, soccer, fishing. <laughs> I've done that for twenty years, and every we'll time, <laughs> yeah, I meet people like Giva and uh, <laughs> my cousin Hormas and Robbie. Just name the date. Yeah, yeah, we'll go out, and you know. <laughs> Seven months later, Rabi, we're still waiting for you. I love fishing and I love um, I love to play soccer, um, ping pong. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and that's about it, I think. And then my boring life. life. No. <laughs> <laughs> my last question is: What is your favorite church hymn? My favorite church hymn. Now, do we want the liturgical or any church hymn? It's up to you. Whatever you would like to do. There's no rules. <laughs> Favorite church hymn is Father of Righteousness, Awat Pushta, simply because there is a, a verse that says, Because I have sinned, your son received. Go ahead and sing it, please. Because I have sinned, your beloved, meaning Jesus Christ, received the spear and the nails on my behalf. That was for those that love to hear Rabbi sing. And I also like this is a this is a, 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 a this one's for Kasha Giwargis Rashu. Uh, In the morning when I rise. <laughs> In the morning when I rise, in the morning when I rise, give me Jesus. That's going to be played for my funeral. And oh. I was telling you guys about that. I was going to say, that's going to be the new intro for the podcast, <laughs> but okay, we can do that too. So, Father, thank you for sharing your testimony. Mm -hmm. You reflect on how God's path for your life thus far has had many unexpected or unplanned turns. Each turn has brought with it challenges, mm -hmm. happiness, sadness, confusion, growth, and many lessons learned. 
Mm -hmm. I'd like to close off by asking you one last question. Mm -hmm. What is one thing from your testimony you hope the listeners take away with them? Be still and know that God is in control. Wait on the Lord. Beautiful. Thank you, Ravi. Thank you. <laughs>